Hi, my name is Ai Fujiwara. I'm the director of Prince Takamado Japan Center for Teaching and Research at University of Alberta. Thank you for watching our webinar series. In this webinar, Professor Daisuke Yasui explores the relationship between food culture and a national identity. He begins with two examples which are familiar to North American viewers Thanksgiving in the United States and Donuts in Canada, as they represent the invented traditions associated with their national identity. Washoku became an integral part of Japan's cultural strategy to sell its soft culture overseas, but Professor Yasui argues that simply promoting Washoku as healthy diet and stressing the significance of its authenticity will not be sufficient to protect Washoku as an intangible cultural heritage. At the same time, problematizing and trying to stop cultural transformation in Japan do not necessarily lead to the promotion of Washoku. As westernization of food accelerates, he points out the significant areas, national self-sufficiency, local production, gender equality, cost, daily eating habits, and so on, which need to be addressed when the state wants to preserve it. So now let's listen to Professor Yasui. Hello, I am Daisuke Yasui from Ritmekan University. I study food culture from a sociological perspective. Today, I will give this talk on Washoku as heritage and national identity. Today's talk is about popular food culture and national identity. To give you a sociological perspective on this topic, let me give you two examples. Many industrialized countries include different cultural, racial, ethnic, social class, and religious groups. It is especially important to have national rituals of solidarity that generate feelings of social cohesion and symbolically incorporate new members. One such ritual is the United States National Holiday of Thanksgiving, celebrated annually on the last Saturday in November. Examining the history of the holiday as both mice and maintain national identity, creating distinctive in and out groups. When you think of the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday, what images come to your mind? While pilgrims, Native Americans, Turkey with all the trimmings, stuffing, mashed potatoes, gravy, cranberry sauce, and pumpkin pie spring to mind for many. The ample meal is based on the U.S. Thanksgiving story. This story in which pilgrims and Native Americans supposedly shared their bountiful harvest in a lavish feast. In fact, it largely invented. That is, the tradition is based on a culturally constructed and idealized version of the first Thanksgiving. According to tradition, the winter of 1621 was the best time for the pilgrims of Primas colony. Why it's not for the Native American friend by sharing a feast and giving thanks to God? However, this story is more mice than reality, as historians, social scientists, and food scholars explain. More accurately, the Thanksgiving tradition was invented to promote American national solidarity following the Civil War. So, based on a fictionalized past, invented traditions like these serve at least three important purposes. First, they symbolize social cohesion and create a strong collective identity. Second, invented traditions establish new social institutions and legitimize existing ones. Finally, invented traditions socialize individuals into the shared norms and values of the group practicing them. Thanksgiving is an important invented tradition grounding the present in an invested past, symbolizing national unity and reaffirming a distinct national identity based on the institution on the family. The U.S. Thanksgiving ritual is just one of many invented traditions used to promote national solidarity. All countries need rituals 
to create a sense of national community. Benedict Anderson called nations imagined communities, since members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them, or even hear of them. Yet, in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. Lacking the reciprocal social ties with all citizens, the ties linking a nation to people are largely imagined. Anderson's concept helps to explain why Thanksgiving is such an important ritual, despite the historical distortions on which it is based. All nations engage in the ritual reformation of shared identity and values. The features of the modern U.S. Thanksgiving reflect the country's particular historical and cultural conditions. Anderson's concept helps to explain why Thanksgiving is such an important ritual, despite the historical distortions on which it is based. All nations engage in the ritual reformation of shared identity and values. The features of the modern U.S. Thanksgiving reflect the country's particular historical and cultural conditions. The next example may be more familiar to you. The donuts, a Canadian food icon, has different regional connotations linked to urban and rural as well as class differences. Before the 1970s, popular media outlets constructed donuts as American fare, and for good reason. Donuts were an American import. Donuts transformed American food to distinctively Canadian and more especially Ontario-based food as late as the 1970s. Restaurant magazines promoted donuts as a means for Canadian restaurants to attract American tourists. But in the context of distinct integrating Canadian cultural anchors in the 1980s and 1990s. The donuts emerged as a powerful symbolic representation of Canadian life. In particular, a sense of shared national values came under attack as Canadian provinces, particularly Francophone Quebec, increasingly voiced disagreement on constitutional matters. Second, the post-industrial economy increasingly divided consumers into the haves and the have-nots. The class fragmentation was reflected in the emergence of upscale coffee shops catering to the middle and upper classes, and donut shops catering to the working class. Within this context, the <laughs> unpretentious donuts affordable to rich and poor alike as a social unifier in an increasing divided Canada. Donut shop became the Canadian equivalent of the English pub, a place all social classes could afford to patronize and where they could mix comfortably to discuss important matters of the day and forge community ties. Such spaces are often termed third places to distinguish them from home and work the first and second places. The symbol of the donuts as a social unifier was supported in popular culture via donut law, citing statistics such as the most donut shops per capita. Rural towns and suburbs erected welcome signs proclaiming to be the donuts capital of Canada, claims that were reinforced verbally by residents. Donut law stands in opposition to a cultural center, most often tolerant with its world, world class pretensions and preys on a sense of ironic pride in marginal status, simultaneously poking fun at the unsophisticated hinterlands and the pretentious metropolis. While Toronto and other Canadian urban centers might boast world class Italy's and entertainment. Rural and suburban Canada had the democratic donuts, a point of pride for those living in the shadows of so-called urban sophistication. The donut wasn't fancy, but it was affordable and tasted good. The donut was thus clearly linked to systems of social inequality through class distinction and rural and urban differences. 
I will got a picture of the sociological perspective. From this point of view, I would like to talk about the Japanese food culture, washoku. You all have different images of Japanese food. But in this talk, I will focus on washoku as an intangible cultural heritage. The word washoku is comprised of two components, wa and shoku. Wa means Japan, and shoku means to eat. Washoku, or Japanese cuisine, is widely recognized for its ingredients that developed out of Japan's geographical, climatic, and regional features. In December 2013, Washoku was registered as an UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage for being traditional dietary culture of the Japanese. At that time, by the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fishery, MAF, uh, M-A-F-F, MAF, Washoku was defined as five having four features. One, a rich variety of fresh ingredients and respect for inherent flavors. Two, nutritional balance that supports a healthy diet. Three, expressions of the beauty of nature and the changing seasons. And a four, an intimate relationship with annual celebrations, such as New Year. This registered Japanese food is not only the material of New Year's rice cake, but also the custom of eating rice cake and making odoni on New Year's Day. It has been registered as a cultural heritage because it is valuable to preserve this custom as important and good. This is good and great, but it's not just good. Rather, it shows that it is worth preserving, but it cannot be left as it is. At this rate, there is a sense of crisis that Japanese eating habits cannot be preserved, maintained, or disappear. Because the current situation is critical, Washoku is on the cultural heritage list. It's a red list, more dangerous than good. Japanese food has been positioned as such because endangered animals are listed and introduced. Therefore, registration on the cultural heritage list also imposes an obligation to protect and inherit. It means that the obligation to protect and inherit must be fulfilled. The fact that it is protected and inherited and that it is dangerous if it is not protected means that not all Japanese eat it. Washoku is not an everyday meal. With this premise, I would like to examine the circumstances under which Japanese food is demanded. Next, I will explain the background to the demand for Japanese food. In fact, the use of the word washoku is quite recent, before the word washoku became popular. A lot of attention was paid to the prehistory of Japanese food and Japanese cuisine. The most famous is the discourse that Japanese food is good for your health. In the 1980s, there was a Japanese food boom in the developed country, especially in the United States. It was around the time that the California law became famous. At that time, Japanese food became popular in urban areas because it was very healthy and good. The longevity of the Japanese people was cited as evidence of their healthy nature. It was also during the bubble era when Japan was economically prosperous. And it was said that Japan's economic power might have something to do with this kind of eating habits. One of the reasons for this attention is the McGovern Report in the United States. This was issued by a U.S. Senator and Congress reported that the U.S. diet was dangerous, obese, and very unhealthy. This report was written to improve the American diet. And one way to improve is to compare it with Japanese food, which is healthy, nutritious, and has a very good balance of protein, oil, and carbohydrates. Therefore, Japanese food had attracted attention and spread around the world beyond this report. With such an image, 
Japanese food is still considered healthy internationally, but this does not necessarily represent the eating habits of many Japanese people in the 21st century. It is true of the diet that many Japanese ate in the 1980s. Such a diet was only temporary at that time. This temporary thing means that Japanese diet before this era was full of vegetables, rice, uh, some pickles, and fish. Many people today think that this is a harsh diet, the era in which such eating habits are gradually becoming westernized, that is, the amount of meat and dairy products is increasing. Has been going on for a long time. This change is still going on. Since the Meiji era, and especially since the introduction of school lunches after the Second World War, Japanese menus have become more westernized and bread consumption has increased. Rice consumption, on the other hand, has declined. Instead, more meat, wheat, milk, and oil were consumed. From the 1960s to the 2000s, the upper tiers of food consumption will change from rice to meat and dairy products. The amount of oil increased accordingly. Because of these changes, the Japanese diet in the 1980s was transitional, a transitional period from a rice-based diet. It's a meal from an era when meat, fish, and vegetables were eaten in just the right balance. After this period, however, the amount of meat will continue to increase. This is why the current Japanese diet is Western Japanese cuisine. The food that many Japanese eat is not as healthy as it was when it was prized as the Japanese diet. In such a situation, Japanese food has become popular. Despite the domestic situation in Japan, the export of Japanese ingredients is growing. This includes selling Japanese food in the form of Japanese culture. There is also a strategy of shifting to soft power and presenting Japanese food as a cool Japan icon. The Japanese government has supported the promotion of national cuisine worldwide in various ways, making washoku, uh, traditional Japanese cuisine, one of the main elements of Japan's soft power and cultural diplomacy. There is a link between Japan's gastro diplomacy, defined as the use of typical food and dishes as an instru instrument of soft power, and Japan's food security strategy. The strategy of promoting washoku worldwide is not just an act of popularizing Japanese food, but is closely related to the issue of the country's low self sufficiency rate. As the government's main objective is to increase food exports in order to promote agricultural production and improve self-sufficiency. In fact, the number of Japanese restaurants overseas is increasing. The number of Japanese restaurants has declined in some regions due to the corona crisis. But it is still growing worldwide. By 2022, there will be around 160,000 Japanese restaurants overseas. As you all know, various Japanese foods are eaten overseas. I think there are many people who have had the experience of thinking that it, uh, that it is not Japanese food, or that it is the wrong Japanese food. In fact, such criticism can be made even now. But the number of Japanese restaurants is increasing at an overwhelming rate. There has been a lot of debate about how to cook, how to look at it, but the reality is that the demand of Japanese food is growing. In 2006, Japan's Ministry of Agriculture ate at a Japanese restaurant in Colorado and noticed that sushi was being served next to Korean barbecue beef. He was outraged. 
claiming that the restaurant was inauthentic and didn't do justice to Japanese culture. However, this was criticized as an infringement of food culture. And the Japanese government was criticized in the Washington Post as being the sushi police. Based on these topics, an animation called Sushi Police was released in 2016. Sushi Police is a social satire on Japanese nationality. Uh, this animation is an interesting topic to think about food culture and authenticity. The trailer video is available on the homepage. So let's take the time to watch this animation after my talk. Regardless of whether Japanese food overseas is authentic Japanese food or not, it is true that there is a gap between what Japanese people think of washoku and what people abroad think of washoku. Japanese food has an image of being healthy, but there are very few empirical studies on washoku and health. Despite the bug and unsubstantiated image, washoku has become popular. If the Japanese government and entrepreneurs want to promote washoku overseas, they need to prepare not only cultural research, but also an empirical research in and uh, research infrastructure based on scientific evidence. As a final summary, I would like to point out the cultural heritage and national identity that emerge from this Washoku research. First of all, the registration of a cultural heritage entails an agreement to take ongoing measures to protect it. So the organization which promoted the registration are creating their own scheme that Washoku is a culture that Japan and the Japanese should protect when it comes to culture. You may think it's good, but sociology doesn't necessarily think that culture just needs to exist. We need to think about why the Japanese protect washoku and what it means to protect washoku. From such a sociological perspective, let's look at the process of making Japanese food our culture Japanese food, a cultural heritage. Uh, Mahfud official messages say that Japanese food is important to Japanese people. They say that Japanese food is an important aspect of culture. I think some parts are true, but I also wonder if it is enough to say that. Of course, we can say that Japanese food culture is a healthy. Japanese food culture is a healthy Japanese food that has been developed by incorporating various cultures. The official message goes on to say that if the Japanese do not protect Japanese food culture, it will be lost. And they feel a sense of crisis that we have to protect it from danger. Otherwise, it will disappear. There is a very strong sense of crisis behind the current movements around Japanese food and protection activities should continue as a cultural heritage. One of these message is that because you are Japanese, you should protect and infect Japanese food. In other words, the nation is working to say that Japanese people have a duty to protect and infect Japanese food. The math report says that one of the good goals is to infect to the next era and participate in the creation of a fine country. This is not a problem as an opinion, but is it all right as uh, a government statement? Many traditional Japanese dishes are modern and new dishes. I first introduced the discourse around Thanksgiving Day and Canadian donuts. Like these examples, Washoku as a cultural heritage is based on invented tradition. These Washoku discourses often emphasize families and local community ties. It is often said that Washoku was always valued eating together. But we can discover communal bonds by eating together in every country, in every region, almost everywhere in the world. Eating together is not unique to Washoku. Moreover, in the natural discourse, 
Women and children are assumed to be the main actors who protect washoku. Modern Japanese kitchen was essentially prepared by mothers and full-time housewives. The division of labor according to gender roles has a strong influence on modern traditional Japanese food culture. However, it is difficult to prepare traditional Japanese food on a daily basis especially for a typical two-income family that doesn't have the time. It is impossible to cook Japanese food. Protecting the food culture itself is good. But the necessary measures to protect the food and food culture are lacking. In fact, the promotion of washoku as a cultural heritage is nothing more than an empty slogan appearing to national identity. I think the reason for this situation is that the market and the states have the right to make decisions, and all those who inherit Japanese food should obey. Of course, we understand that some policies have to, have to be decided from the top down by the government. The role of the government is important. So I think politics has a lot to do. However, in this configuration, uh, this uh, triangle configuration, citizens are put in the position of mere consumers in terms of what to buy and what to eat. I think what is really needed is for citizens to be proactively involved, like thinking about washoku on their lawn and thinking about Japanese food on their lawn. And we also need a society that enables such relationships. For example, when the Japanese family sits around the dinner table together, parents should be able to come home early from work, and children should be able to share their living space so that they can return home early and the family can meet at the same time. To achieve this, if parents have many jobs, and cannot return to the kitchen. We need to think about changing to shorter working hours. But if you only think about the place where you eat and the kitchen where you cook, you will not be able to see the conditions that make up eating together around it. After all, it's harder for the family to surround the meal because they have to go home at different times. We must consider not only eating, but also social circumstances around eating. In this way, I think it is necessary for society to work not only from the market and the states, but also from the student to the market and the states. Uh, today's talk is over. And uh, this list is a list of references used in this talk. If you are interested in my talk or, or uh, my talk topics, please check the articles and books. Thank you for watching my talks. Thank you.